Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. Today we're going to look at the discovery confirming another attempt by Chris Watts to cause a miscarriage besides those that have been discussed uh, in the media and online uh, at this point. Before we get to that, uh, please subscribe to this channel, click the bell, uh, like and leave a comment. We're going to start off today's episode by looking at oxycontin and oxycodone and looking at whether these drugs can cause a miscarriage. I thought it was a obvious question and answer but uh, it's apparently not that obvious to some people so there definitely is a more technical aspect to this particular aspect which probably does require uh, true crime rocket science. Once we've gone through that, we will then do more analysis, which goes into the discovery connecting some of the symptoms that are classic symptoms of uh, an overdose of oxycodone to what we find in the discovery. And I think you will see that it's pretty interesting. It's pretty alarming as well. Um, th the true horror is that what this means is that Chris Watts was slowly making attempts on the life of his unborn child while he, while he was with his wife and he didn't just make one attempt, he, he probably made several. So we're going to get to that. Let's first start with the issue of oxycodone. You know, can it cause a miscarriage? And I think the best way to provide an analogy for this is to look at many other um, everyday drugs and substances that that one can make the same arguments about. So let's start with say one of the most harmless sugar. You might say, well, you know, can can sugar cause a life-threatening situation? You know, if someone throws an extra spoonful or two of sugar in someone's coffee, is that going to cause some kind of reaction? And the answer is generally no. But if someone has a su sensitivity to sugar, something as everyday and common as sugar, and you know, it's a it's a idiosyncratic. Um, reaction that, that someone might have, you know, they might be, m might have diabetes or whatever it is, then, then that could cause a serious reaction. Then we go from that to sleeping pills. Uh, if you take sleeping pills, could that cause a serious reaction in a person? And the, and the answer is, well, if you take one sleeping pill as required then you're not going to get a adverse effect i'm i'm someone who's very susceptible to insomnia and uh, lack of sleep and i've actually been trying not to take sleeping pills and this year i've probably taken the most ever which is not a lot but for me it's a lot and the medication where i'm from is the equivalent I think to Ambien in the States and if I take one pill it sort of um, affects my it negatively affects my ability to reason uh, well, o well over a day so what I've found is if I take even a quarter of a pill it can really put me to sleep because because I don't have any resistance to it um, last night I actually struggled to sleep and I took half half an ambient and it worked like a charm and this is where we start getting to the crux of it is you know certain medications will have different impacts on different people based on their sensitivities to it so when I was overseas earlier this year it was important to maintain a proper day night sleep cycle and so for the first time ever I took a long prescription sleep medication which I'd never applied for before um, and 
it worked, but it definitely seemed to wear off after a couple of days. After a couple of days, even taking an entire tablet didn't quite have the same effect. And, and what became worrying was when one took a, uh, took a pill and then one stayed awake. Now, I couldn't imagine that now where I, you know, I take half of one and, and, and it really works like a bomb. So you take something like sleeping pills and you say, well, could you, could you die of, of, of by taking a sleeping pill? And the answer is obviously not. If you take one, you wouldn't. It's the abuse of it that can cause serious problems. And sleeping pills are serious medications, Schedule 5, which which have to be, you, ca you can't get them over the counter uh, because they can be abused and, and they can become addictive and so on and so on. Um, another good example is alcohol. You know, can you die of, by, you know, by drinking a glass of wine, can you die of drinking a beer? Obviously not. You know, alcohol is an everyday su substance. Can it be lethal? Of course it can be. And you know, you, you also get the, the aspect where you can get alcohol, you can get beer that's 3.5% and you can get whiskey that's, you know, and, and um, hard liquor that's close to 50% or even more. And that, that is when you have these much larger doses, you know, someone is not used to it, given quickly or secretly, it could can have a devastating effect. So, you know, if you apply that to oxycodone, it also applies. So I've seen people saying that they they took oxycodone when they were pregnant. Probably they took a low dose, like 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams. It's a fact that the, the dose Chris Watts Googled was a very powerful, sort of the, the, the extreme end of the spectrum. 80 milligrams is a lot. And it becomes even more dangerous when you start to do certain things with it, such as uh, grind it down into a powder. Um, there are specific indications in the literature saying that that as soon as you do that, you can actually allow the what should be slow release of of this potent drug to be released very quickly, and that that's basically like drinking pure alcohol instead of drinking beer, alcohol or whiskey, as soon as you start interfering with the um, absorption of it, you can have some serious impacts. So when you go through the um, literature, and, and I appreciate that when you Google some of these uh, descriptions, when you just go online and you search for the information about OxyContin, you're going to need to use your um, discernment and you're going to need to use your intelligence because some people are, you know, some of the reviews and some of the information out there is meant to sell the product. So you're not going to get too much negative, um, negative aspects highlighted where someone is trying to peddle the product to you. It's in a way a similar situation to when you try and find out about say Thrive or multiple multi-level marketing companies and you go online. Y you've got to know whether you're reading it from the perspective of a neutral person or whether you're reading it from the perspective of someone who's promoting it or is being paid to promote it or something like that. So someone who has got a, a horse in the race, so to speak. So when you do sort of go through the online archives of describing oxycodone, it is a bit mind-numbing because there's a lot of technical jargon. There's a bit of confusion. Is it oxycontin or oxycodone? Basically, we're talking about the same thing. So anyone who wants to argue that it that it's not oxycodone it's oxycontin or it's not oxycontin let's just agree that basically we're dealing with the same thing which is an opioid that's basically what you're talking about it's like arguing are we dealing with an ambient sleeping pill or x y z other sleeping pill the point is it's a sleeping pill so um when you sort of go through the 
um, go through the literature as I say there's a heck of a lot of information and what we are interested in is looking at what impacts are life-threatening what are some of the side effects and particularly what can happen when it's used or abused or administered excessively in terms of um, pregnancy now if you look at a box of text it sort of just looks like almost like chemistry um, it just looks very impenetrable but when we get a when we sort of zoom in on it and we look at uh, some of the details in the text we see for example that accidental ingestion of oxycontin especially by children can result in a fatal overdose of oxycodone so I, I think it's quite interesting how they phrase that is you know the oxycontin is in all caps so that's an accidental ingestion of oxycontin can lead to a fatal overdose of oxycodone and that's where I think you can see how interchangeable it is it doesn't really matter how you want to refer to it um, it also refers to a specification to swallow the oxycontin whole sw swallow the tablets whole to avoid exposure to potential fatal over uh, a dose of oxycodone and so what this is telling you is you you are taking in a medication which if you take it as prescribed then it is generally safe and it's going to do what it needs to do but something as simple as changing the tablet where you grind it down you turn it into a powder right that is going to change its pharmacodynamics significantly to the extent that the absorption can be fatal just a simple thing like that so um, you get the same thing uh, where, where there's a reference here to prolonged use of oxycontin during pregnancy can result in neonatal opioid withdrawal symptom sy syndrome which may be life-threatening if not recognized or treated what they're talking about here is you using oxycontin sort of over a prolonged period during pregnancy it's not a high enough dose to kill you the parent and it's not a high enough dose to kill the infant or the fetus but when the fetus is born then the then, then the um, then you will have something called neonatal opioid withdrawal f syndrome which could kill the child so you could literally have the child being born uh, but but with sort of an addiction a serious addiction so it says here if prolonged opioid use is required in a pregnant woman advise the patient of the risk of neonatal opioid withdrawal and then there should be treatment I don't really want to go into that so much because I don't think th that's what we're talking about here but um, what what stands out in a very big way is that children simply coming across this drug could die of a overdose simply because it's it's um, the formulation can work for adults but it can literally kill children especially children who have not been um, habituated to it and so basically what you have here is the acknowledgement that this drug can kill children simply giving it to children can kill them right um, if we go through the next generic description and, and this is a medication guide it, it actually looks like an official version of all the permutations and all the sort of details don't take oxycontin if you have this if you for example if you have severe asthma right so, so um, and we know that the children had asthma right so so three aspects that come up here that are really interesting are for example just the precautions around oxycontin saying um, if you pregnant or planning to become pregnant prolonged use during pregnancy can cause withdrawal symptoms in your newborn baby that could be life-threatening now 
again you can argue the details and say well no that is after the baby's born or whatever the point is you're talking about a, a contraindication in um, a drug that that is being explicitly named as life-threatening and irrespective of what you think and irrespective of what even a doctor might say about the efficacy or the uh, how lethal this this drug possibly is to a fetus the point is that Chris Watts thought that it was and the fact is it is I'm not saying it's necessarily that great a choice in terms of bringing about a miscarriage but it's certainly is a lethal um, potentially lethal um, medication and that's not disputed I mean th the fact that <coughs> excuse me the fact that so many Americans are dying daily shows that this drug when abused can be deadly and so how do you abuse it? it's very simple you simply um, change its format you, you, you turn it from a tablet to a powder and you make sure you've got the strong tablets and, and you know what did what's Google he googled 80 milligrams um, we also know that Shanann had lupus and for a long time and one can anticipate that she became somewhat inured to the lower doses of of oxycodone that, that when she used it, it it had less and less of an effect which prompted her to to raise the dose we can assume this from the fact that we know that Shanann had lupus for many years and we can assume that taking this medication for many years would have that effect so it does make sense um, so you can imagine if Chris Watts is googling the way that we've been googling that you might come across this information that that it that it can be basically can come across the words life-threatening juxtaposed with pregnancy and oxycontin and that's essentially what he's looking for right um, it also says uh, for breastfeeding mothers not recommended during treatment with oxycontin it may harm your baby that's also just a simple thing that if you taking this medication and you have a young child simply the transfer of this drug through breast milk can even be harmful and then um, it also refers to taking prescription or over-counter medicines vitamins or herbal herbal supplements um, with so taking oxycontin with any of these can cause serious side effects that could lead to death now bear in mind that Shanann is doing exactly that she's taking these thrive patches which are described as sort of vitamin supplements and herbal supplements and so what in a way seems to possibly be relying on the fact that you w would have serious side effects with with this other drug and then the last thing I'm going to raise here which I've mentioned before is again um, the restrictions are made quite explicit here that you know take this drug exactly as prescribed by a health provider and use the lowest dose possible for the shortest time period so that's really important is the dose is what will determine whether it's lethal or not and then also the length of time that this dose is given so even a, a a higher dose that's not necessarily a lethal dose over time can cause serious problems um, and again I just want to highlight this from the from the schedule it, it talks about swallow oxycontin whole do not cut break chew crush dissolve snort or inject oxycontin because this may cause you to overdose and die and, th and I think that more than anything tells you just how potentially deadly this can be and so when Watts reads this that's exactly what he wants it's a perfect um, invisible murder weapon which 
um, is also perfectly plausible. It's perfectly plausible that Shanann would be using it. It's perfectly plausible that it would be in her bloodstream. So if she did have a miscarriage, um, it, it, it would simply be, well, you know, th there was a problem with the medication you were taking anyway, kind of thing. Um, a more interesting question is whether Chris Watts wasn't trying to bring about a miscarriage, but that he was actually trying to kill kind of two birds with, with one stone, in terms of both Shanann and the, the child. Um, that's taking things a little bit further, but anyway, for the purposes of this episode, I want to deal with the symptoms of OxyContin, and then I want to deal with the symptoms that we know Shanann had. Um, now, if you Google OxyContin and, and sort of side effects, there's a great resource that sort of puts them out there and they sort of almost blur into a kind of in in interchangeable vague listing of symptoms it just seems that there's so many symptoms that it's sort of neither here nor there um, and these are constipation, nausea, stomach pain, loss of appetite, vomiting, sleepiness, tiredness, drowsiness, dizziness, lightheadedness, weakness, itching, headache, dry mouth, sweating, and uh, decrease in the ability to feel pain, right? Now, when you drill down into those, so one might say, well, you know, how different really is stomach pain from nausea? Um, how different is stomach pain from loss of appetite? Um, isn't loss of appetite and vomiting really coming down to the same thing? Isn't tiredness and drowsiness the same? Isn't dizziness and lightheadedness the same? Isn't weakness and tiredness the same thing? No, it's not. It's not. And so... And so we're going to look at the um, aspects to these common adverse reactions. And the fact is some of these reactions are far more common and adverse than others. So uh, at the top of the list is constipation. So 23% uh, of people tested um, rated put constipation really, really high. Um, nausea was as high uh, at 23 percent as well and then about half you had about half as much um, in terms of these instances suffering from dizziness um, and vomiting and then slightly less than that from headache and dry mouth right uh, when i was um, younger i went to ireland and i did a medical trial with Harris Labs and they tested morphine and it was a fun trial because morphine is nice to be on and they paid us quite a lot of money and part of it was upping the dose and what I remember was the dose as the dose went up and up and up um, one got progressively more lightheaded and I remember seeing double if I was watching TV I literally saw two televisions and I would try and concentrate to see one screen but um, eventually the medication was so strong that you just sort of um, spaced out and you just watch two televisions whatever and but what I remember came up with that was it seems like the morphine um, makes one so relaxed that what also kind of relaxes is your digestive system in the sense that it's not working as, as it should. Um, basically, it's almost like your whole body just kind of goes a little bit limp. All the functions just sort of um, become lazy, right? And so your body functions are lazy. And so I remember just from the morphine b becoming quite constipated, and I'm not someone who gets constipated. Um, I remember there being nausea um, and I also remember 
feeling a sense of um, wanting to wanting to bring up or, or just a sense of um, feeling a little bit sick um, so there's a part of you that's feeling good you're feeling sort of lightheaded in quite a nice way and you, you're sort of enjoying the the ride in a way but there's a point where it's the dose is so high that that it's 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 kind of too much I guess it's a little like having too much alcohol there's a point where you lightheaded lightheaded and then the point goes you, you cross the line and then you then you actually feel sick and that's and that's I think the case with oxycodone where you also you know you cross that that threshold of feeling soothed and now you're feeling um, spaced out and and not 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 in control and not um, there's there's too much sort of going on and I, I want to strongly associate morphine with oxycodone it's the same sort of thing as a painkiller pain and then it also sort of seems to take away um, the ability of the brain to regulate other processes such as digestion I mean I remember s a, a strong sense that my lower abdomen was, was kind of quite numb um, I remember that quite clearly so yeah so so constipation is a major adverse reaction and so is nausea and s and then dizziness is less so but still fairly significant and then vomiting is is also sort of matched to the dizziness and then headache is slightly less so what you can also say is if the headache is is least y um, if you've got the headache you can you can bet that you've got all the other symptoms as well now I remember when we did this trial if we did one week we would get paid a certain amount of money which is quite a lot and if we did two weeks then we would get paid double and if we paid three if we did it for three weeks then we'd get triple and then I remember some of the guys in the medical trial had stuff going on after two weeks and they were sort of no we don't want to be here for two weeks and I don't know whether they sort of really felt adverse reactions or whether they sort of um, made things happen some some other way but um, they started vomiting and 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 that got the trial reduced from three weeks to two weeks and I remember being quite upset about it um, I, I also didn't feel that well but I really wanted that extra week's money and I don't know whether they just talking about being sick um, made them sick but it, it seemed like th they sort of decided beforehand that they needed to not be there and so if enough people got sick then 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 they, w they said they would cut down the trial and then th then enough people did get sick um, so in in any event I'm just bringing up the fact that that vomiting is strongly associated with um, the adverse reactions of these kind of painkillers um, at at high doses. Um, in some of the fine print of of the other schedules that I've come across online, that they just talk about oxycodone that could cause complications such as poor growth of the baby stillbirth, premature delivery and c-section there are some schedules that are quite positive basically saying there's no problem taking oxycodone um, and one of them is this one that says it's generally acceptable controlled studies in pregnant women show no evidence of fetal risk so um, they're basically taking the point that since there's no information that shows risk amongst women then it, then it may be acceptable um, which I think is quite disingenuous you know if people can die of overdoses then sh of course your 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 um, your fetus is at risk you know if you're taking an excessive dose so to say it's generally acceptable and there's no evidence of risk 
seems seems a, a bit dishonest. Um, it even goes so far as to say is used in life-threatening emergencies when no safer drug is available. Um, and then, then it does mention positive evidence of human fetal risk. So someone's trying very hard to make sure the drug is used and, and sort of hedging the fact that there's, there might be some sort of danger. And then there's another aspect right at the bottom saying, do not use in pregnancy. Risks involved outweigh potential benefits. Safer alternatives exist. And that's, that's at the bottom of the list of, of advice where it starts out saying that it's generally acceptable to use during pregnancy. Um, then in one of the, sh the schedules it pertinently asked the question can taking oxycodone during my pregnancy increase the chance of miscarriage and the answer is given here there are no published studies looking at whether taking oxycodone increases the chance of miscarriage this does not mean there is an increased chance or that there is no increased chance it only means that this question has not been answered which is ridiculous it's a ridiculous thing to put in there but um, I think th this relies on someone's intelligence to say well this is a risky medication as it is um, you know, should you be using it when pregnant and I think the answer is pretty obvious you shouldn't I think it's like alcohol or smoking um, but potentially even worse Then in some of the coverage online, there are, again, more explicit warnings. So, for example, th this is not referring specifically to oxycodone. It's just referring to opioids in general. And so the question is, what are the risks of taking opioids during pregnancy? And then it gives a couple of bullets and it says the possible risks include loss of the baby, either miscarriage and this is for before 20 weeks of pregnancy or stillbirth after 20 or more weeks so there you have it quite explicit and then they refer to you know if you are going to if you if you insist on taking opioids when pregnant um, these are the ways to do it and and then they provide five suggestions take them for the shortest time possible take the lowest dose that will help you and so on right and so I the more you go through all of this the more you do start finding there's both mention made that that it's completely harmless and don't worry about it but then there's also quite a lot of information saying that you should be very careful and rather don't use it and um, there's another one from from another site which which specifically refers to again it's the gen generic thing of opioids and saying that miscarriage or stillbirth is possible and saying that miscarriage is the death of a baby in the womb before 20 weeks of pregnancy um, and so they're saying that's that is a risk okay so I hope that's cleared up the fact that it's possible for oxycodone to induce a miscarriage whether you want to argue that it's not the best method that's your argument one can also argue that you know if you went and bought a prescription medication that that would raise a flag in itself and also um, the difference between that and buying oxycodone or, or getting hold of oxy oxycodone is the one is something that Shanann would have been using anyway the other one could point the finger at him which he didn't want okay so now we're going to deal with an aspect that this um, episode is really addressing, which is that the discovery confirms that another attempt by Chris Watts was made to cause a miscarriage, another attempt besides those that have already been reported.
it's the position at True Crime Rocket Science that there were at least two attempts to bring about a miscarriage. The first was on the first day in North Carolina, and this makes sense both from the perspective of Shanann's sudden onset of ill health when he arrived, and also what other members, uh, family members witnessed. But it also makes sense that the moment Watts arrived in North Carolina, he was still caught up in the addictive blush and bloom of love and lust with his mistress. The pregnancy posed a clear and present danger to that, and hence that was his target. And as we can see, he wasted no time in going after his target. I mean, the moment he got home, he wanted to fix things, in, in his words. In the third confession, uh, Watts admits that he googled oxycodone 80 milligrams prior to traveling to North Carolina. In other words, prior to or on July 31st, 2018. And based on his research, he understood this dose would bring about a miscarriage. Although his spiel is that Shanann said she had a headache and asked him to get an over-the-counter painkiller, this is unlikely. Shanann had her own medications and was very OCD about everything. So if Watts handed her an 80 milligram pill and she caught him out, there would have been hell to pay. I mean, imagine that. She asks him to get him pain medication and he gets her something that's really, really strong. Now, that's why it's important to know what was she using gen generally. Um, and we also don't know, you know, was Shanann aware of what she should be taking and what she shouldn't be taking? Um, so I, th I just think it makes sense that what wouldn't have been open about giving her an 80 milligram dose of oxycodone. I, I don't think he would have just given it to her and she would have taken it without, without thinking. Um, bear in mind what nut Nutcate was all about. Nutcate was all about CC being kind of presented with peanuts in ice cream. It wasn't even given to her, it was just there and this this was like this was like a murder weapon in itself, you know. If Cece had eaten some of the ice cream, could she have died and you know, did someone want her to die? And yeah you have an an ominous analogy to that only um two or three weeks later and do you really think Watts would sort of take the risk of basically doing his version of putting ice cream with nuts uh, in front of Cece, but this time in terms of Shanann and the fetus? Do you really think he would sort of be prepared to risk the volcano exploding based on him literally doing it out in the open? So. It's my opinion that he would he would have done this, but he would have done it secretly. So he could have grinded down the pill and put it in her shake, or he could have um, made the, the pill fine and and put it in a glass of water or something, or whatever it is, and or even over her food when she wasn't looking, and um, that would have been the best way to administer it. In other words, secretly, slyly. Um, basically in a crafty way. Um, we know for a fact that Shanann was drinking shakes every day and um, drinking them daily and I mean this was part of what you see on social media showing that the shakes she was drinking and um, but the fact that she vomited after this first ingestion probably saved the baby's life. And we know that she did vomit. Um, if we go to what Frankie Rusick said in early August, he said that Shanann had actually made a Facebook post about how she was dehydrated from being in the South. But Rusick said there was no way because she drank a lot of water. And this is from the Discovery Documents, page 685. While dehydration is another symptom of oxycodone overdose. On August 6th, Shanann texted Cassie that she felt dizzy, lightheaded, and nauseous. All of these are symptoms of oxycodone overdose. And then very um, 
crucially that she hadn't pooped in weeks due to constipation and that's discovery documents page 632 constipation is another typical symptom of anoxicodone overdose if not as we mentioned earlier the classical sy symptom the major symptom so you know we're going to very early august then august the 6th so a week after what had arrived shanann still feeling ill and then and then august 6th sorry august 10th we get this text and all i want to sort of reinforce is the idea that just from this and i mean these are these are sort of a few of the surviving texts just this from from just this we basically get um, around about 10 days of Shanann feeling constantly ill and anyone would probably have said yeah no it's, it's related to her being pregnant but she also said that she'd never felt like this before right um, and on August 10th at 06.43 Shanann texted Watts the following and I think it's very um, suspicious that, that Watts didn't delete this particular message um, it may be that he kept it so that he could explain something that happened later on something that he may have needed to explain he could have explained it by referring to this text where she's admitting to not feeling good so th so this is the text message and it's from the discovery documents page 2110 I don't know why I feel really weak standing I'm drinking a Gatorade and had a biscuit getting ready to take off what time kids wake up so what you get here is something very unusual it's is she's mystified herself that she's feeling very weak just standing and she talks about drinking a Gatorade which seems to be addressing issues of dehydration possibly but um, she's asking him this question and what's really interesting is he answers her back saying that the weakness is probably due just to lack of sleep and it's in this interchange that you really get a sense of the silver fox as a guy who is lurking with Shanann around Shanann in the in the context of when they were in North Carolina and and the whole time is literally undermining and trying to poison her and trying to kill the child so he probably made many attempts and he was sort of we, we know that he was distant and he was probably watching her and, and, and seeing the reaction seeing you know is this working that I've done and then trying again and then seeing that she was ill again and um, and then you know continuing to spend time on his phone with his mistress and that but that's the game that he was playing he, he was trying to target the fetus of his wife while he was there while he was engaging with his mistress and he was basically looking is this working you know maybe I should give her another dose and he didn't want to be near her he, he was there to for, for a very specific reason and that is pretty hor horrifying and that's pretty chilling um, so you know what's his version in the third confession was that he tried to induce a miscarriage twice but then he corrected it to just once um, it's the contention of true crime rocket science that more likely made several attempts each time increasing the dose but failing to achieve the desired effect and there may be a couple of reasons why it didn't work one may be that whenever Shanann vomited well then you know you could say if he gave her too high a dose and she vomited then then it was out of her system um, but if he gave her too low a dose then nothing would happen so and then there could also have been contraindications with her anti-nausea uh, medication and so on um, what's probably also felt he would rather err on the side of a low dose than a too high dose because you know in that sense he could be caught out so you know you wouldn't want to give her 
an incredibly high dose and then and then people would find out well you know how did this get into her body um, bear in mind also that we know that she had a doctor's appointment on the Monday at 10 o'clock and so if there had been a um, drug related issue and she hadn't died um, who knows maybe he would have taken a blood sample then and maybe um, you could have had nutgate based on him tr literally trying to to kill the baby but a, a sort of a nutgate response to that where, where Shanann realized what he was trying to do and that that would have been pretty um, a pretty spectacular explosion right um, I'm not going to take it further than that um, but I do think that there's potentially a psychological link between the this idea of nutgate and the almost accidental use of the peanut allergy and the and the peanuts where you know something kind of harmless that can cause death and then you take that psychology into the psychology of um, where you want to get rid of someone but you're going to do it using kind of their own medications and their own sensitivities um, Personally, I don't believe that um, I don't believe that we should look that much at what's trying to cause a miscarriage. I think that is a factor, but I think what's even more um, pertinent, which isn't raised in this third confession, is just how vulnerable young children are to a very high dose of something like oxycodone. That's all over the literature. That's not in dispute, and that's something that was my version and certainly the true crime rocket science version through the nine narratives starting with the very first one just that it would make sense to kill his children in a painless way and in, and in an invisible way um, and he didn't need to go anywhere to sort of get a weapon or anything like that um, to, it would literally be in the seemingly harmless context of putting them to sleep and so I don't see why the um, psychology of the miscarriage uh, moving to the children um, isn't likely. The one thing that I do um, dispute is this idea that Watts would then, you know, in, in one of his versions he gave her the oxycodone before he killed her. But that would mean he'd have to give it to her and then wait for her for, for it to take effect wait for her to become drowsy that's his version um, and then the other aspect is you know how do you know when you're gonna be able to give it to someone if it's she's come home between you know at two o'clock in the morning now now you hoping that she's gonna drink something um, I don't know whether it's very easy to dissolve that in water um, but you know you're now in a situation where you've you've got basically two hours to work with and, and in this version you having sex with her you're murdering the other children and then you've got to administer a drink that she's going to drink and then wait for it to take effect sorry I just don't I don't see that as um, likely or even logical but that's the version we 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 dealt and um, we need to consider it at least and decide whether we think it's true what do you think okay so thank you for listening to this episode uh, if you like the analysis here please subscribe to the channel uh, ring the bell for further notifications I'm trying to load up around about a video a day um, if you haven't gone to look at the analysis on um, Amanda Knox debunking Gladwell's chapter about it. Please go and have a look at that. And yeah, if you if you've enjoyed this, please like and leave a comment. 
at the moment um, I'm researching uh, a new book and a new series on the case and this excerpt this this episode has, has really been just providing a little glimpse at some of the information that I came across um, related to the symptoms of oxycodone um, that text between Shanann and and Chris Watts on August 10th before she left for Arizona I think is is pretty um, stands out it stands out as as far as I'm concerned his very last attempt to fix things um, and who knows if she had had a miscarriage then maybe all the other things wouldn't have happened um, so so that's maybe something worth thinking about. Anyway, thank you for listening. And uh, if you haven't read any of the Two Face series, I do highly recommend you go and have a look. Um, even though the facts weren't that well known, for example, in Book One, some of the suggestions uh, made in Book One are actually being uh, are, are coming true um, right now. So so that's that's interesting to see um, I do recommend drilling through discovery and then bear in mind that Two-Face Oblivion is also available in paperback thanks for listening uh, but understand that at this point I still can't answer questions about the facts surrounding the investigation uh, really all everyone wanted uh, throughout was justice for Shanann and Bella and Celeste. We're certainly uh, pleased that this seems to be that. I think all of those who were involved never truly believed that you would give us an accurate statement. What I can tell you most affirmatively uh, today by what happened before me is the spotlight that he tried to shine on Shanann falsely, incorrectly, and frankly a flat out lie. Is the spotlight that he tried to shine on Shanann falsely, incorrectly, frankly a flat out lie?